So this is lecture 21 of ECE uh, 2305. And so in today's lecture, what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about routing protocols. So this idea of how you get information from point A to point B through all these intermediate relay nodes. And we're going to focus on link state routing algorithms and distant vector algorithms. Um, in other words, we're going to be focusing on one particular link state routing algorithm called Dijkstra's algorithm. And distance vector algorithm, we're going to be looking at um, Bellman-Ford algorithm. Okay? So let, let's get to it. So first of all, so when you do routing, there are a lot of design considerations you have to take, in, uh, you have to take in. So the first one is whether you're going to have a global or decentralized type of network. What does that mean? So global means everybody has perfect understanding of everyone else in that network. Reality, in a small network, that might be doable. In a very large network, ain't going to happen, right? Like the internet, like, oh, I know exactly what this other guy in country XYZ is doing with his computer. Absolutely not practical. So maybe for small networks, global is, is great. And global is great, because if you have a network that is of completely aware of every other node in that network, you know, you can do a lot of things very simply. But you have, to, first of all, it doesn't scale well. And the second thing is also something called an overhead channel. You need to feed, constantly update that information in that global network, as opposed to decentralized, which is just your neighbor, right? So, so like, you know, so what happens is a decentralized network, all you care about is the guy next to you here, the guy next to you over there, and what their status is. And then you're hoping then that that guy knows who you are and the guy next to him and so on. So let's say you five, six, yeah. So you guys here. So all you care about is this guy. You just care about these two guys. You care about these two guys, right? So what happens is, are you ready to receive my information? Uh-huh. And then. No, no, I'm not ready. So you buffer the information, and then you pass it progressively along. right? So what, what the decentralized approach is, it's nearest neighbor. All you care about is the guy next to you, not all the way around the world. So it has the advantage of it scales nicely. But on the other hand, it's, there is that sort of uh, that, that, that lack of global understanding. So let's say. You keep on going down a path that might be the completely wrong path, like a black hole, if you will. It's like, oh, this server is dead. Oh, darn, now I have to reroute back and go around. And what is that? That's latency, right? So on one hand, decentralized is simpler. On the other hand, you can get caught in like a sort of a trap where you keep on routing to a location. You get stuck. You have to go back out, and you, you reroute your way out of it. Not necessarily the most optimal way. And one of the problems is this idea of static versus dynamic. Static is great because let's say for the next five minutes, everybody stays where they are, right? I completely understand the network. Everybody here completely understands the network. So if I start passing notes to everybody, like, I think Professor Wiglinski looks funny, <laughs> and then you know, pass it to you. And then what happens is eventually it gets routed to, let's say, the guys in the corner over there, right? What happens if there's this flux in the, in the network? And some people leave, and then other people come in. And they're not really aware. And you don't know if that message is now going to make it to the other end of the room, right? I hope it doesn't make it. But you know. So what happens is there's this idea of the network dynamically changing, and as well as being static. right? So, so you've got to take into consideration that routing, like especially in the internet, the internet, um, there is a certain level of dyna uh, dynamics involved, right? Like servers going online, servers getting congested, they can't take on any more requests, you have to reroute around it, right? Um, uh, what happens? Um, let's say somebody digs up with their backhoe some part of, like, networking cable that connects two cities, uh, there's an explosion in the telephone office, yada, 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 you know, which has happened and brought down the internet. So, before we before we talk about more of the um, practical considerations, let's talk about what does it mean to route. So like we talked about this before. We talked about this a couple lectures ago between forwarding and routing. Right? Forwarding is the action of pass information, pass information, 
pass information, right? From one hop to the next to the next. Routing is coming up with the path from A to B through that field of servers and intermediate routers, right? So Dijkstra, and that's just a cool name, Dijkstra, right? Dijkstra, what it does is, first of all, so it looks at the overall topology it know, it, and, and link costs of all nodes. Okay, so it's one of those, like, I have global information type things, right? And what happens is Dijkstra's algorithm computes the least cost path from one node called the source to all other nodes, and there's a forwarding table involved. Again, like, you know, you're, it's probably assuming global knowledge and a static environment. Doesn't change very fast. So what ends up happening is you develop essentially, like you find the end-to-end -end, uh, least costly path from A to B. So there's some notation. Your book uses a different notation, but it comes out to the same thing. What happens is you have something called a cost, right? Cost is bad, right? It's like, it's going to cost you this much. What do we prefer? The cost be as low as possible, right? On the other hand, the person selling to you, Wants the cost as high as possible, right? So what happens is um, cost is bad. Cost means that there's a certain amount of energy or resources allocated in order to get information from point X to point Y. We usually want to keep that very low, right? Either latency, there's a cost in that, energy, bandwidth, all of those are costs, right? And then DV is the cost of the current path from source to the destination. So up to destination V. So we're going to look at the first example of Dijkstra. What is this DV? What does this mean? And then PV means the predecessor node along the path. So what happens is we're going to be connecting the dots, but in a very interesting way, which I hope I'll draw right. And then N of N prime tells you all the nodes that are already part of that path. OK, so you know I'm doing a lot of hand waving. And this algorithm, you can look at it, and it's like, oh, wow, OK, this makes total sense to me. I'll try, I'll, I'll try and talk this through, but I think the example will really get to it. What, what you essentially do is the following. You initialize all the nodes that are part of the end-to-end -end path so far. You send it to the first node, the source node. Then what you do is you look at all adjacent nodes of nodes that belong to that set n, and you say, OK, who has the lowest aggregate cost, right, from the source to that, uh, all the adjacent nodes? Then what you do is you progressively add on into that set. Like anyone who's not part of that set, you just continuously increase, right, that set. You basically are looking for paths that at the end of the day, you have the lowest cost to from point A to point B. But again, let's, let's do an example. Because I can do hand waving, but this is just so much more intuitive. I even brought notes. Ha! <laughs> okay. So your book has this really interesting diagram. Do, 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 do. Okay. So you've got N1. So this is figure 19.1, okay? Just a heads up. And what we've got is we have these collection of nodes, six of them. Node 2, node 3, and node 6. And then we have something that looks like this. I know, it's just going to take five minutes just to draw this darn thing. <laughs> so what ends up happening, so we have this big network, and it gets even more complicated. Yeah. We have that. Okay. And we have also this really big woo network there. Connection. So what ends up happening is I want to go from here. I want to go over here. So I want to go from node one. I want to route through all these nodes to node six. That's my objective. So what would Dijkstra do? Dijkstra. Okay, I, got, I think I spelt it right. It's really weird when you have IJ in the middle of all this, right? So what happens is we start, according to Dijkstra, we say that N prime is equal to node 1. I'm just going to call it 1, okay? Now what happens is we look to all adjacent nodes to node 1. 
And so what we do is there's actually a cost to each one of these links. Two, three, one, seven, eight, five. Okay? So what ends up happening is we look at the cost, okay, the aggregate cost of the path, which is just one hop anyway, to the adjacent nodes two, three, and, uh, sorry, two, four, and three. So how much does it cost to go from one to three? Five, whatever, widgets, dollars, rubles, you call it, right? Now, how much does it cost to go from node one to node two? Two. Mm, that's not bad. That's cheaper than uh, five there, right? Oh, but it costs only one unit to go from node one to node four. I think I've got my winner. So what happens is I now associate in my set of nodes one and four. So now I include four, node four, as part of this set. And, th okay, so this guy has a cost of zero, like the, the actual node. And it costs one unit to get to node four. Now, I repeat, I look at node n2, n3, and n5, and n3, of course. So what happens is now I look for all adjacent nodes in the network to n1 and n4. Who has the lowest cost of them all? N to n. Right? What do I mean by that? So, so I can do, like, for instance, I can say, okay, n1, n1 to n2. What's the cost? 2. n1 to n4 to n2. What's the cost? The cumulative cost. n1 to n4 to n5. n1 to n4 to n3. And then, of course, n1 to n3 as well. What I'm looking for now is starting at n1, what happens is if I go to n4, I can hop another. Right? If, on the other hand, if it's n1 straight to n2 or n3, I just do the one hop. How much does it cost? So, for instance, it still costs two units to go from n1 to n2. Now, n1 to n4 to n2, and that, folks, is equal to 2 and 2. And then, finally, we have n1 to n4 to n3. And that guy is also 1, 1. So what it turns out, when we do the calculation, the least costly path right, to a node that's, no long, that's not part of n prime is n2. You might say, well, what about this? n1, n4, n5. That's also a cost of 2. But it's more hops. Right? So I choose the one that has the least number of hops. So the tiebreaker is the number of hops. So now what happens is I now include in my set n2. So now I have 1, 2, 4. And now I repeat again. So n1, oh yeah, and the cost of going to n2 from n1 is 2. Right? I repeat. Now I do n1 to n2 to n3, and that path, see, I have to keep notes, otherwise I'm going to go crazy. That's going to cost 5. Mm, that's a little expensive. How about n1 to n2 to n4? Well, that's 4. That's already kind of costly, right? And, and then if we go one more. But what it turns out, if we do this again, it turns out that the next cheapest path that's not included, like the node that's not included, so would be n1 to n4 to n5. That actually is equal to 2. So this guy, n5 is included. So And I repeat again, and it so actually, let's use colors. Colors help. <coughs> so, <coughs> so what, where I'm at right now is I figured that this path, uh, see, colors help a lot. 
this path here and this path here gives me an overall end-to-end -end cost of 2. So reaching from n1 to n5 at this stage is equal to 2. Remember in the previous stage, to reach from n1 to n2 is 2. To reach from, in the previous stage before that, to go from n1 to n4 is equal to 1. If we now proceed, what's the next, which node should we include next? Is it n6 or is it n3? So if we do every possible path, we do, let's say, n1 to n3, right? That's 5. If we do n1 to n2 to n3, what is that? 2 plus 3. That's also 5. If we do n1 to n2, and what's the next one? And then these two guys here are 3 and 3 apiece. So n1, right, to n4 to n3, that's 4. That's cheaper than doing this, right? It's cheaper than doing this. And how about this guy? n1 to n4, n4 to n5, and then these guys... Ah, actually, this is the cheapest of them all. This is 3. So this path, n1 to n4, n4 to n5, n5 to n3 is a cost of 3. Right? And then finally, the last step. If we do all these hops, so now we need somehow to include n6. It turns out that the, the cheapest path is n1 to n1, I mean, sorry, n1 to n4, n4 to n5, and then this path here is 2. It turns out it's a cost of 4. That's the cheapest cost to get from n1 to n6. So what does Dijkstra do? So what Dijkstra does is it progressively, it, it look, it, you, you sort of bootstrap. You start with the one source node and say, who is the cheapest node I could go to first? Then, now I have two nodes in my set. <coughs> Who's the next cheapest node that's not part of my set I can go to next? I include him in my set, and I repeat. So here at the bottom, and then finally the last one, <coughs> what this guy is here, I know, it's so confusing. You have to just like, um, you know, grind through this. Um, you know, uh, like, you know, afterwards, like go through the diagram and draw it. But what ends up happening is that there's this progression where at the end of the day, you know exactly how much it will cost to go from N1 to N6, N to N, all right? So it's bootstrapping, and sometimes it's none too obvious, right? Especially when you have something loopy like this. So be careful when you go on the internet. If you do this, I do this all the time. Like, you know, yesterday I was like typing to Google, tell me how to build a garden fence, you know? And today I said, tell me about Dijkstra's algorithm, right? And the Dijkstra algorithm definition and examples are not quite there. So th the way you form this least cost path is through this bootstrapping step, one at a time. Now, Bellman, Ford, on the other hand, okay? Yes. I don't understand in that example why the zero state is two in the set when the like you went to two, but then your final path didn't include it. Ah, perfect question. So why why did two get included but it wasn't included in the final path? Perfect question. The answer is what happens is we're exploring all possible paths, right? So what happens is this is that dead end reference I made a few minutes ago with passing something and then the dynamics change. What happens is, suppose you say, this guy is the cheapest first step out, or middle step, right? But then, the next guy, the only way to go from that point, the only way I can move forward, is through this very costly step afterwards. What this does, what this process does, is essentially it looks ahead. So it looks progressively, not necessarily at the next step, which could be cheapest, but it looks several steps along in the overall che cheapest path, right? So two at the end of the day actually did not pan out to be that cheap. It's actually, if you try, if you go down two, who's the next guy? Three, I can go down, it'll cost me two, and then it'll get more expensive from there. What ends up happening is, if I progress any other path other than this one, I will incur a, 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 a cost greater than this, this overall end-to-end -end path of, one, four, five, and six. 
So that's a great point. What happens is if I go N2, I'm already not getting the cheapest path. Right? So that's an excellent question. OK. OK, so time is running out. So I'll just quickly go to Bellman. Well, actually, uh, let, let's, let's take a couple of minutes. So, so first of all, uh, so Dijkstra tries to ensure that shortest path in terms of the costs and such, but it's not feasible for large networks. Imagine if you guys had to draw this for something with like 100 nodes. Not practical, right? It's going to take forever just to find the end-to-end -end path. So on the other hand, we have this other guy, Bellman Ford. And so what Bellman Ford does is slightly different. Okay? What Bellman Ford is the following. Um, yeah, actually, let's. I'm going to delete that. I. Ah. So what Bellman Ford does is the following. Recycling this diagram, what Bellman Ford does is it first looks at first hop. And it says, okay, no, oh, missing here. So that's n four. So Bellman Ford says, okay, first hop, how much does it cost me in each direction from the source, right? And it will say, oh, okay, it's going to cost me two, and here it's going to cost me one. So obviously this path, you know, in a one hop, so h equals one scenario, this is cheaper. Now let's do two hops and see what happens. So I do two hops, hop and hop. And this gives me an overall cost of two. And every other two hop scheme that I have is going to be more expensive than that, right? For h equals two. Now, let's do three hops. One, two, let's say then it does three, or any combination. But it turns out, if you try every three hop combination, it turns out that Bellman Ford says this is going to be the cheapest, and we already reach our destination node over here. It turns out that with Bellman Ford, what it does is instead of sort of slowly building up these costs and uh, uh, costs for every step of the way, and you're trying to find the least costly, instead what you're trying to do is at every hop you say, OK, now I have three hops. Who's going to be the cheapest algorithm? Uh, who's going to be the cheapest path out of this? All right. OK, so and of course, what happens is we use something called a distance vector algorithm. And so what happens is this computes the cost to each neighbor and maintains that distance vector. And at the end of the day, what we want is that from time to time, each node sends its own distance vector estimate to its neighbor. So they are kept in the loop in terms of information. And so ultimately, what the Bellman-Ford equation does with the distance vector is attempt to solve this minimization problem. OK, so with that, um, hopefully, is uh, lecture 21.